the sessions more you know taking a practical approach as to how you guys might want to go out there and be yoga teachers essentially so yeah um oh chat about something else okay so when we think about I know on the schedule we write social media um but really the session's more looking at a bit of branding a bit of marketing a bit of um a bit of business when it comes to yoga, which tends to be quite a, a difficult, not conversation to have, but it tends to be quite tricky because we, in discussions like this, we really only speak about like how yoga has become quite commercialized. And we, we do contribute to that in a way, because if we do take this on as a living, it is something that we need to speak about. If you are fortunate enough to have a, full-time job and maybe you're doing this for yourself or want to do a few classes on the side there's not a lot of pressure on um, making an income from it and having to support yourself financially as a yoga teacher and we can speak about the realities of that and see how can we set everyone up for success in whatever ventures they want to take on so we'll break this down into three different strips we'll first look at refining uh, let's let's do a little bit of a background as to why we want to do this we'll go into a bit of branding uh, a little bit of social media and then we'll just speak about general questions you guys guys might have about what happens you know where to from here let's say you've done your teacher training now now what how do we do this kind of thing so we can fill in the gaps if you have any questions about approaching studios starting your own thing um want to get a general idea about the market or the industry then we can cover that together. So I don't know if I mentioned this before, but other than teaching yoga, a lot of that the work I do is with uh, Yoga South Africa, which is a platform that showcases, um, it's pretty much a promotional platform and advertising space, as well as a directory for anything within the yoga and wellness industry. So a lot of the work I do is running that website and sharing upcoming yoga retreats, trainings, offerings through our social media pages. And I started that about five, six years ago while I was still studying occupational therapy. So I had no, I had no clue what marketing and social media and hardly knew much about the yoga world as well. And so everything that I'm sharing is really just from my observations and discussions of teachers within the community, how we can set ourselves up for success and how we can support ourselves um, if you're taking this on as a career and some of the tips that have really helped me along the way and hopefully that helps cut off a few years of planning of your time and makes it easier for you guys. So I, let me start again. When I started Yoga South Africa, I created my own little website and I did this um, I didn't want to pay a web developer because the amount I was quoted was excruciating and I did not have those kind of resources right now. And I decided to go into Wix and create my own website, which I thought was marvelous. But looking back, I kind of, you know, crawl under my shell thinking about what my website looked like. But hey, we all had to start somewhere. And I was approached by a wonderful teacher. I don't know if any of you guys have been, no, not a teacher. Um, I wonder if any of you guys had ever heard of that yoga mat brand called Sentience. They were one of the first brands in South Africa that came out with beautifully printed yoga mats that are unfortunately not around anymore. And Claire, who started that, she came up to me and said, hey, Taryn, how do you feel about a rebrand? I was like, you know what, Claire, I'm really attached. I put a lot of work into this. Let me just give it a shot. And I was so untrusting. I just thought, how everything you've created, how do you know someone's going to see your vision? How do you know someone's going to understand you so well that they can put your core offering and your values into a product? She was right. She did an incredible job of it. And I had a few sessions with her where she really just taught me a lot about the value of, firstly, knowing it's okay to start off small and figuring things out yourself before jumping to all kinds of web developers and marketing and unless that's with it already within your field you're lucky also that it's okay to ask for help and um, teaching me a lot about knowing what you want to do and becoming really really clear on how you want to show up and your purpose within the space and I think that that clarity and setting that foundation has now carried me through the last three years with so much more guidance on what you really want. So 
if we think about the yoga world, and I, I guess I'm not even going to say yoga world because Clara, unfortunately, I don't know much about international, but I'll give you a bit of a vibe about South Africa and to really just highlight what is happening in the yoga space. We know they are, it's in, I think the wellness in general is an incredibly saturated space. There are a lot of yoga teachers. There's a lot of life coaches and wellness professionals because the entire, if we can even say wellness, health and wellness industry has just boomed over the last few years. And I think, um, I just want to read Clara's message. Mm, I'm happy to take it. Yes, take some South Africa that side. That's great. Um, and some of it will probably ap apply because a lot of these concepts are universal. But if we think about the, the industry growing, there's a lot of more, there's a lot more professionals within this space. I can't, I can even tell you the amount of yoga teacher trainings that happen in South Africa every year. And considering there's 10 to 20 people on each of those trainings, not everyone goes out to teach. Not everyone is doing a training for the sole purpose of teaching. And, but there's always a lot more teachers. That being said, there's also a lot more people that are practicing yoga. I think even in the last year, a lot more people are coming to practice yoga because of the holistic benefits they experience more so than just any traditional forms um, or not traditional, any other forms of movement or exercise that they were doing. So I always see that although there's this increase in the amount of practice, uh, teachers and we see it as incredibly saturated space, there's also a lot more availability because yoga is becoming more of not so much an accepted practice, but it's becoming more available in different areas. So in schools, in communities, in workplaces, in the, maybe the last five years or so. So it is giving us a lot more opportunities. And the, what's going to help us a lot is to figure out where do we fit in and how am I going to kind of fill into that spot that I think is going to be most suitable for the work that I want to do. I have, when, when you're a yoga teacher, you feel like everyone's a yoga teacher and like it feels so, so saturated of sorts. But I remember being an OT and feeling like there were just so many OTs. So whatever you're doing, because those are the people you're around, it feels like there's so many more of you. But I think there's so, such an amount of, of gaps where we can really bring yoga into. Why, why do we want to do this? And firstly is, we want to be able to become really clear so that we can find students who are going to be who are going to resonate with you as a teacher the more clear we become the more and it, it's not something that you guys will have uh all done and sorted by the end of this session because you haven't really started teaching yet it's only when you teach that you know okay i like this i don't like this i tried teaching yen class didn't work for me and slowly probably over the first year or two of teaching you'll start to refine what will work best for you and then you can start to actively incorporate that into any sort of more assertive marketing that you want to do and i'm a firm believer that you should try everything to know what you like and what you don't like you know i used to teach privates i didn't actually like privates but laura loves them she teaches privates quite a lot i find really it's not my favorite i've done them and it's fine but maybe I like teaching kids where someone goes, mm -mm, kids not going to work for me. So there's are so many different scopes you can go to, not only in the different styles, but in the different venues. Okay. Once you become really clear on that, you can start targeting those people and really start to create offerings in that area. And yeah, I think it's also just helps us find our voice as a teacher and we can really grow in our own capacity. So when we think about what um, no, I'm going to skip the rest of it. Let's chat about that in social media. So get your little paper and pen out. This may change, but I want you guys to take some notes and just see where we're at at this moment. And I created a little social media and marketing course that I have up on Yoga South Africa. And I'm going to take you guys through uh, a couple of the chapters now together. It's a bit of a, um, think of it like a workbook. But there's pretty much a four-step process in any sort of branding technique we go through. Does anyone work in branding and marketing and graphic design or anything in that like social media? Little bit. Okay, cool. So we know a little bit. That's okay. But now this is the first time that we might be, apply might be applying it to yoga. So let's go under step, just write a one. So there's a little four-step process we'll go through. Number one, I want you to write down... Um, maybe write your name at the top so we can be like, this is who I am. And here's my little vision board, whether it's a mind map. 
First, I want you to write down what style you think you want to teach. So let's start off really broad. Vinyasa, yin, kids, prenatal. Maybe it's something you haven't, you want to do further training in. Where do you feel like you're gravitating towards? And I want you to keep it specific. For each of these, one word, maybe two. And you might want to write down the question very shorthand, although it will be easy to come back to it, just in case, like in two weeks from now, you change your mind, which is very likely. Okay, after we've gone through what style you want to teach, write down where do you want to teach? It's uh, not really easy to say that now because we're quite limited, but um, is it studios? Is it at home? Is it at gyms, corporates, retreats, outdoors, um, schools? online maybe you want to do some online stuff where do you feel you want to teach one or two things i i firmly believe yoga teachers shouldn't sh shouldn't solely rely on one offering because it's really hard to do that so i'll probably recommend two but it's always nice to have one core focus okay the number three who do you see coming to your classes who is your ideal audience and not in terms of like demographics or age. I mean, age can be something. I mean, if you're teaching kids, your target is, well, your target's more the parents because they're going to get their kids there. But maybe you see certain practitioners, maybe it's corporates, maybe it's doctors, maybe it's nurses, maybe it's kids, maybe it's teachers, maybe it's fitness enthusiasts, uh, triathletes, maybe it's just regular, anyone who really wants to come. It, it can be... If you're looking at accessibility, are we looking at marginalized groups? Are we looking at communities? So it's such a broad amount. Think of something that you're passionate about. Is it the elderly? I say elderly, but older practitioner is probably the right word. I used to love teaching older practitioners. They were my favorites. Older practitioners and kids. Oldies and the youngies. Okay. Then I want you to write down in terms of yoga, but also on a personal capacity, what are your three key values? What are your three things that are most important to you, but three things that you want to bring through your yoga that are non-negotiables? It's not really any rules as here. It can be as something like accessibility, connection, wisdom, spirituality. It could be strength. It, it really is three things that are your values. And these are essentially things that are important to you, but will come through your offerings and your branding very clearly. Um, it's the experience you want to offer that are going to make your students resonate with you the most. And then my favorite question, what, what makes you unique? What's going to set you apart? It's like that interview question where you go, oh, this again. But you're not sharing this. You can be quite focused in on one thing that makes you stand out. Why, why are people going to want to come to my classes? And it's more so than saying I'm really passionate about the work that I do. It could be I want to work with kids because I'm a really energetic person or I have strong understanding of the movement of the body. I have a strong um, spiritual connection that I want to share or it can be anything. It can also be you used to work in corporates, so you know what it's like working in corporate. That's what makes you unique offering corporate yoga is that you know or not that you know what they're experiencing, you have experienced something maybe similar before and that gives you an up. We've had just an example, sorry, on a tangent here. We had so many students last year who used to work at like um, lodges on safaris and stuff. And they're like, I don't know what makes me unique. I'm like, how about the fact that you're in nature all the time and you are so connected to the safari lodge, that is your connection to nature is what makes you unique in offering something like retreats because that is your life. It's like Monique and her mindfulness. It's like, it, that's what makes her unique is that she lives that. So yeah, that's that. 
And this is kind of the, the five questions I like to ask to create a little bit of an idea of where we move to from here. Is there anyone who's feeling like, hey, I might want to share just one person to share their things. And the only reason I'm asking one to share is because it's nice for people to see how different our answers are and how we stand alone. No one? Should I share what mine was? <laughs> Elaine. Elaine's always there. She's like, I got you guys. I'm happy to answer. Oh, mine's going to be the weirdest. Um, so I'm a Breti practitioner. So I work with the medicine of Iboga. And I've also been managing a plant medicine community for the last 10 years of about 10,000 people. And I've been trying to teach people that the medicine is actually inside us and to get people to use less plants and to, to develop a more embodied spiritual practice. So what I would like to do is to open up yoga as uh, and to introduce people, first of all, to yoga as an integrated spiritual practice to to draw them away from constantly running to, you know, I believe plant medicine opens you up, but then to to ground and to integrate, but also to look at the benefits of microdosing, um, which is literally like it's like a pinch of um, a plant such as iboga which its its purpose is to take you into a place of stillness <laughs> Elon, sorry elaine can i can i interrupt for a moment we're going to get into that later can i ask you to answer those five questions first before yes. we get into the next step just so that i want to see how the five can compare before we get into creating our our experience so we can just sure. step by step so what what type what style of yoga would you like to teach um, I, I, I'm not too sure if it's vinyasa. I think probably more combination of hatha and yin. Okay, cool. Um, well, it's a slower, more refined styles, not more refined, slower, more introspective styles rather. Um, where do you want to teach? Where would this happen? Where do you see it happening? Definitely sort of my own space and also retreats in nature. Amazing. You see, so it's like, I, I just want to see how you can start in the answers. You can start visualizing this thing coming together. Um, who who do you see coming to your classes? Your I, I say your target audience or who who would come your client? Um, people who are looking to um, integrate a spiritual practice, spiritual seekers. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So that's a great thing. Spiritual seekers, people who are looking, who are already on that path of maybe diving into the spiritual, um, more mind, body, embodiment experience. Um, three core values. Um, respect for lineages, um, traditional lineages, uh, cultural appropriation, um, and creating a sense of connection to self and oneness. Lovely. Okay, I love that. I'm not going to go into the whole the uniqueness thing because I think that's I want that I want you guys to keep that for yourself. I want that to be your your thing. So when I want to keep Elaine's in her mind there, does anyone else want to share theirs? Might be something completely different. <laughs> go ahead. Completely different. <laughs> yes, of course that everyone's is going to be completely different. This is, this is not in the context if I actually do end up teaching. Like, I'm still a little bit on the fence. Um, but if I was going to teach, the style that I want to teach is uh, some kind of form of Buddhakon yoga or uh, that kind of uh, slower vinyasa or more strength-based uh, in that sense. A lot more flowy. Um, okay. Uh, where? Um, probably private gyms, schools, dojos, online, that kind of thing. Um, audience would be athletes, uh, people who want to do mobility work. Um, I also really want to work with men and boys as well, do some kind of like, a, I don't know, skills workshop or something. Um, but I also said anybody with a movement or martial arts kind of practice um, would kind of fall into the audience. And then my three core values can kind of be kind of uh, be summarized by tapas because it encompasses strength, discipline, and movement. 
but also purification. Mm -hmm. So it's hard work, but yeah, it's it's basically leading you to be the best version of yourself. I love that. Okay, cool. So I see Dee put her hand up. Thanks, Ron. That sounds awesome. Uh, Matt's like, yes, I'm a client. <laughs> you guys should just team up and do stuff together. I see a collaboration happening here. Um, do you guys follow uh, Dave Gardner? Yeah, I'd highly recommend checking out Dave Gardner. Ron, did you put your hand up? You have practiced with him before. Yeah, Dave is awesome. Also works within that uh, Budokan, Animal Locomotion, and another page to follow is Crawl Project, uh, Richard Dean Sumarez in Cape Town. Both very cool. Okay. Um, Dee, did you also want to share yours? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I think like what I want to think of a slow flow vinyasa. So just a slower vinyasa, um, yin, and um, I want to do chair yoga for the oldies. Love it, love it, love it, love it. And and I want to have my own studio. My husband's going to build on at home for me, like in the garden. But that'll take a while. So I have got some premises in the meanwhile. And then I want to do women and men 50 to 70 years old, healthy, but wanting to strengthen up. Mm. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, I think my three core things would be strength, um, flexibility, and I don't know how to describe the third one, kind of like a self sufficiency, like I'm enough. Like yeah, that. empowerment, yeah. also empowering yourself. Oh, yeah. Empowerment, yes. yes. You're working with older practitioners. Um, or in my experience, the woman I worked with, the oldest student that came into my class was 84. And I loved it because the students would come in and I'd be like, how are you doing? And they'd turn around and she'd be like, oh, I forgot my hearing aid today. And I was like, damn it, what are you going to do this class? And they would come into the class with, you know, a lot of things happening that come with old age, but they would do a tree pose and suddenly it is this, I can balance on one leg. How damn cool is this? And so it's a really encouraging and rewarding space to work in because you're teaching people, yeah. not teaching, you're facilitating a space where they can trust their bodies again. So I love that. Yeah. Made me. I get so excited listening to your stories. Usually I ask, because we split this up into two days. Sometimes I ask you guys to email me. So if you do want to email me your answers just like i recommend like for ruan sometimes i think of teachers to check out just from years of being in the yoga space you kind of know who you start to resonate with certain people to of who to watch and who to look out for and stuff like that so what i wanted to highlight with that is just in a group of 12 of us do you see how different three of them were okay and sometimes look a lot of us might leave you and go you know i just want to teach vinyasa in a mainstream studio chilled but you are still going to be incredibly different from another teacher who's going to teach the slot after you because your own uniqueness is going to allow people to come and you know resonate with you so can in I the can I say something else? yes 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 no, i just wanted to say how grateful i am for that first statement that you made which was um when you started talking about marketing you said be clear about attracting the students you want mm -hmm. and the kind of students who want you because i've been very confused about how to kind of like mm -hmm. eliminate those 30 year old and I don't really want, you know what I mean? So now I, I can see that that's a, a clear way to go. <coughs> right. And I choked on my tea. <laughs> Ooh, um, you know what D, it will happen. It will happen naturally. It will happen naturally. I used to teach outdoors quite a lot. Let me just save myself. I started when I moved to Cape Town, I did my yoga teacher training and I immediately came to Cape Town and thought, what am I going to do? Where am I going to start? And I contact all the studios and it's really challenging to get into a studio when you haven't trained there or you don't know them because they, they often got their core group of teachers that they rotate. So it's really hard to just kind of get, did I miss a joke? Some, something looked funny, Belinda. What did I miss? Sorry, I couldn't control my face with that one. <laughs> I didn't, I, what did we get? Oh, what, with me choking? Uh, oh. <laughs> no, 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 we didn't laugh at you choking. That's if terrible. It funny, if it was funny, I wouldn't mind. No, I run comments in the chat. Oh. <laughs> um. Okay, I'm not going to read the chat. You guys just have your side jokes. Don't worry. You can totally laugh at me if I'm joking. It's no problem. So anyway, I moved to moved to Cape Town and I thought um, 
great, let me just try and contact all these studios and try and get in. And it was really, really difficult. And I managed to get into three studios and very soon picked up like, this feels like a space where I get to teach the yoga I want to teach, or this, this studio aligns with my values. And not that studios were had the wrong values it was more just like we want a different thing so you start to find a place where you the students coming into the class have the same values as you and what you offer and there's kind of like this mutual understanding and I eventually started teaching outside because I could offer it at a more affordable rate and the people who came to the class were loving what I was offering and I was loving teaching those who were coming so it happens organically organically the people who don't resonate with you will come to your class and then leave and move on and not a problem maybe the studio down the road is the perfect fit for them so that's a big thing that I believe is that not everyone's going to love you as a teacher um, which is fine we also don't love all the classes we go to because we find a teacher that we work with so that's something that I really try to highlight because sometimes in the yoga space with teachers they can be you might experience it, you might not, depending where you teach. There's somewhat like this competitiveness of, I want these classes, because it's really difficult to get work that you hold on to it quite tightly. Like, oh, I want to take these classes. I want to do this because these opportunities don't come up often. But I have noticed in my experience that the more that I say, even last night, I got an email, someone asking me if I wanted to do a mindfulness session. And I thought, well, this sounds like Monique's Avenue. And I put it in touch with Monique and it wasn't a loss of work for me because I know if something had to come up, Monique would be like, mm -mm, you got to touch Taryn about this. So you really do find what fits and it takes years. It's not like when you just start teaching, you're going to want to give up opportunities that come in, but you'll start to notice which ones are super aligned with what you want to offer and the other things you can kind of refer out, which is why I believe that no one's really in competition with each other because I think we're all so different. One can't compare. It's the same reason why in Cape Town Main Road, you can have just in Cape Town CBD, you can have four yoga studios on one street and they might feel competitive between them because they go, oh, there's just another studio that's opened up just out the road. But one's offering hot yoga and the other one's offering Hatha and Yen. Two different clients, you know, maybe someone wants to do both of them, but then they'll do both or they'll choose one according to them. It's got nothing to do with the studio, right? So that's just kind of something I like to say from the get-go because the mo if you know your audience and you know what else is happening in your community you'll know how do I set myself apart and if I don't want to set myself apart how does that offer opportunity for me to collaborate and work with people because together you also by bringing two forces together you're targeting a lot more so you can choose both if you're working with people that you resonate with it works great Belinda <clears throat> So my husband is in the coffee industry and I mean that is also such an like unsaturated market because everyone that wants to have a little income when they are retired opens a little coffee shop in a small town or whatever and he actually has a really cool viewpoint on it and it, it links in with what you just said. He says the more good coffee places that there are in an area the more you change the palette of the of the town or of the people meaning that they are going to be consuming more good coffee creating a need for more people to give good coffee and that's exactly the same right the more you get people into yoga the more they want to do yoga the more teachers are required because you won't be able to handle the load so the, the bigger the pie, the more people you can give to. So. Yeah, I love that. And I also think that we, we sometimes, I think it's human nature and, and maybe just with the current uh, economic climate and even in South Africa, we want to keep our, our cards really close to our chest, which is natural because we want to protect ourselves. We want ourselves to do well, but it's also in the support of, um, and it's, it's tricky, you know, there's, <laughs> you want to do that, but at the same time, you, you will have your core group of students that will come, but you don't need 100 students to come in through your door. And probably you won't need the capacity of 100 students. I think for me, when I was teaching outdoors, I had 50 people who would come regularly, but very, you know, on and off, on and off. And so if you think about, if only 50 people are coming to my classes, there might be thousands of more in my area, where are they going? So it, there, there is a lot of people to go around for the amount of yoga offerings we have. And I see it in, in, all, different, in, in all different styles. A friend of mine just opened, opened a little studio 
not just open it's been open for about a year but she doesn't do yoga she does like bar and pilates and stuff like that and her, her small studio can only have eight per class so yes yeah, she's got a lot of classes but her giant clientele is definitely under a hundred and because people are doing that and they may be at the gym and they may be doing a yoga class there so there's a lot you know people need to do a lot and be a lot and that's okay and people might come to your class and then also not come for a while and as teachers we have to be like that's also okay they it's not on me they don't want my yoga right now and that's okay all right so if we can just understand that like competition versus community space I think it will help us a lot because you'll learn how to integrate and manage that dynamic going out there I hope no one experiences it but you might and that's maybe this kind of elicits that conversation um Elaine did you have a question um, just a, a, a comment, um, just working in a community of, of healers, oh sorry, my camera's off, um, what, what I found was quite funny is that there was, and there often arises a lot of competition, um, at which, which you know, you, you'd think is, is quite silly, but uh, what one of the international uh, healers that I brought out said, why I say all this competition, it's not like we're going to run out of people to heal. <laughs> and I think the, the same with yoga, you know, it, it's, it's a nice way to think about it is that we're not going to run out of people who, you know, can be exposed to yoga. And I just, just one thought, you know, the way that I started my, my training business um, was I started to run, um, uh, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd run free courses um, which exposed people and then through word of mouth I, I would just pick up more and more and more clients and and maybe that's just also a strategy just to put out there yeah we'll chat about that later and how we can how do we one get people to know about our offerings two get them to stay and how do we keep thinking outside the box so we can keep offering them something new so those are key points i'll come to later okay so that's level one we've now kind of established where we are and now number two we're not going to get into the actual design component of it but we're going to look at um when you get into your branding i'll just give you guys like a little bit of a prelude into what that would look like and you guys can go out there and do your own like and I, I say branding in a sense of, we think of logos and colors and pretty fonts and stuff. And for me, it means more than that. Branding is not just like a pretty logo on a website, which yes, it does play a role of it, but it really is the story that you're telling behind that. So it's, a, it's an experience that your students will have when they come to your class or your retreats or workshops. It's something that sets you apart due to everything that you've listed in number one. So your branding is, the kind of music you play, the style that you teach, the um, the color of the walls in the studio, it's the incense or any smells or candles that you have in the room. It's everything together. It's the way that you teach. It's your personality. Someone that's calm and nurturing is going to have a different approach to someone who's more lively and energetic. It's an entirely, entirely different scope. And so we look at this experience and say, okay, if I close my eyes and I imagine myself teaching, in my mind, my perfect experience would be a setup like this, this type, you know, what would that look like? And how can I package that and put that into a visual aspect that my students can see and when they see that, know exactly what they'll experience. And can I find a, um, what would the word be? Almost a similarity, it's not quite the same. Can it be a true reflection, an authentic reflection of who I really am? So that when people see your branding or that, because chances are that's what they'll come across first because social media is like the thing now. So when they see you online or if they see a post or they drive past your studio, are they going to know, ah, I know exactly what I'm going to experience at that place. Or can we make that as clear for them as possible? So that's what I see branding is strongly aligned to your values. So even if you change and grow as a teacher, your values aren't going to change. And so people need to know that if you are a yoga teacher, this is what has set you apart. And you can easily tell that from a space. You guys can see it if you scroll through social media, you can look at one page and see, oh, I think I know what kind of experience I'm gonna have here versus there. Same thing we do with restaurants. <laughs> you know, when you drive past an Italian restaurant and a Chinese restaurant, the, it's almost like not even just the design and the, it's, it, the experience that you'll have there is completely different. 
and it's the same at uh, um, at a yoga class. Okay, so that's kind of what we want to keep in mind when we go into it. So we go into design number two, and I want you guys to write this down, and I'll show you one of the tools I use to kind of play around with some creation things. But I want you to write one or two moods, emotions that you want to cultivate in your classes or in your experience. What do you want your students to feel? Um, yeah, you know, what is that? What does that mood or experience look like? And then when we get more into the design aspect of this, I want you to write down um, and just a rough, a, a color, colors that resonate with you. So um, there's a lot of psychology that goes into colors and definitely worth some research into what colors are generally associated with certain things. But you might have an idea of certain colors that when you close your eyes, this is what you associate with you. Is it, more, it could be more blues, naturals, baby colors, organic, leafy greens, you know, it can be really general. And then I want you to write, um, I'm not going to go into fonts right now because I think that's something you guys will have to experiment with, but I want you to think of what kind of icons and imagery relate to you. So are you thinking um, nature, organic, ocean, floral, or are you thinking more structured? Um, it's more just trying to build on the visual with abstract creative elements. So if I think of wellness connection, um, a lot of the branding is greens and neutrals, uh, the kind of the, the logos, the leaves, which you guys didn't get to experience, but more relates to the yoga studio in the forest. <laughs> but just to kind of paint that picture, it's so beautiful. Come visit us once. I'm gonna go there tomorrow, but it's so pretty. So pretty. So yeah, just to kind of wrap up imagery and sometimes you will need to go through images to know what you like but just brief overview okay then i want you to write down if there are any social media platforms that you would like to use in your marketing if you don't use social media platforms then that's fine yeah i feel my job is social media and i also have that uh, feeling <laughs> like aren't we over this now <laughs> And keeping that in mind, do you like social media? If you don't like social media, you're not going to have a good time going on there every day to have to do your job. So I firmly believe that for probably for the last two years, a lot of the focus was like, oh, if you don't have a website, you can't be a successful business. Or if you don't have 10,000 followers on Instagram, you can't have a success. It's not true at all, because if you are feeling like you don't use social media, it's likely that maybe your clients don't use social media. So think about that. And we, we can find many ways to find students in a way that's going to kind of like work for us. So that's that. Social media is, of course, you can use websites, newsletters, any sorts of media that we're communicating with people, WhatsApp, um, TikTok, <laughs> um, Facebook, websites, anything like that, that you think you'll be using. Um, CD, so I would also say Facebook is very good for even older generations now, Facebook is a very good tool to use. Um, if you were targeting anyone under the age of 25, they're not on Facebook. It's like, they're not even on Instagram anymore. They've already moved on to the next thing. So you obviously want to use tools and social media that your clients are using. I know for me on Yoga South Africa, a large amount of our core target group are on Instagram, but my most effective means of marketing is not Instagram. It's actually the website and the newsletter. 
but a lot of people see it first on Instagram. So it, it depends on the nature of your business that you want to run and how am I, how am I going to use it? And do I need to use it? Because like Dee said, you can even start small word of mouth and build it up from there. It's friends and friends of friends and it kind of goes from there. Okay. So that's kind of stage two with the design. And then you actually get into your number three, which is your creation. And that's where you go into and you create your logo and you make all your social media marketing material and you actually spend some time creating stuff. That is your number three. You might create a website if you want. We can chat a bit about websites and see, are they really useful? Are they not? Depends if you use them. Yes, they're great. If they just sit there, it's often sometimes they go unseen because there's a lot of websites out there. People don't necessarily just land on a website naturally it needs it requires hard work and then number four which is your maintenance and um Catherine shouts at me because like a year back we sat down and I was like Catherine we need to we need to do a little bit more social media stuff because Catherine wasn't a lot on social media but her website was really good and she'd built up a really good network over time but now she'll shout at me and go oh I've got to like post on Instagram again because consistency is key it's not something you can just do like once a month, unfortunately. So it does take time. Keep that into account as to whether you can do that at the moment. A lot of people can have a successful business without social media, but how else, how, how are you going to get clients, right? You got to just think out the box. So consistency, engagement, interacting with clients, um, getting some kind of turnover and finding a way to authentically engage with people, especially now in the last year where we're not just going out and seeing people at coffee shops. It's like the only time we connect with people is online. So how can we use that to our favor to show people what we're offering? Okay, Clara. And I think with the social media stuff or all of this online stuff, it can take time to kind of figure out what you want and maybe you don't quite know what teacher you want to be yet. At least that's part of what I'm thinking. And so in the beginning, maybe if you figure out a name or you use your own name to begin with and then ask the people you work with to, you know, use their social media platforms so that you don't have to establish your brand right away. Yeah, I think I 100% agree. I think there's no rush to establish something without really just figuring yourself out first, because you might want to change your mind and you totally can. And so the, it depends when you leave here, do you want to go out and be like, I'm Clara yoga teacher at these corporates and they do the marketing and, or whatever the case, they, I approach them and say, hi, I'm a yoga teacher. Can I, this is what I offer. And I create some sort of material in the form of in infographic or brochure or something that I need to give to them and maybe do a free trial class for them to get to know me what is that going to what is that interaction going to look like and in some cases if you are I mean you wouldn't need you wouldn't need to do extensive work you just I'm, I'm Clara I am my personal brand and I am a yoga teacher and this is who I am compared to like a company or uh, maybe you and three other instructors come together and decide to create a brand that is all about corporate wellness and together you guys cultivate something you want to create a website that shows your packages and it's on a larger scale once again it's a it's a spectrum you don't have to even go through this branding process if you just want to teach at your local virgin active you won't have to go through this because they're going to do all the marketing for you. you're going to pitch up there and teach right a lot of teachers who just kind of go around and teach at a lot of classes don't have to go about this because I am just I'm, I'm a teacher that's just kind of teaching at a lot of studios and fitting into those slots of sorts there's not a lot of pressure on me to establish a brand so that I can seek more clients the studio might do that for me or people will come to the studio already if that makes sense as opposed to someone who's going out on their own and wanting to establish establish themselves as a business does that make sense because it's like it's not really yeah amy doesn't always have to be as extensive is what i'm saying um i wanted to ask with regards to like starting a business starting a platform with like your experience would you say it's easier to start just you alone and then you have your student your clients or do you think it'll be easier starting off with someone else or starting like with wellness connections obviously it's like you it's Catherine, it's laura and it's everyone like do you feel it's easier when there's more people involved in the business than just being on your own? Well, I've only ever started things by my own. Uh, no, 
That's a lie. That's not true. Um, so I think that it depends on your business. If you're starting it by yourself, it's usually easier because you you taking any types of risks or timing depends on the kind of nature of the business, any business that you're starting. Starting with yourself or other people, I don't think it really matters. Um, but if you're starting something by yourself, you might be associated more personally, where as opposed to starting a I'm not going to say company because company often associates that you're going through a certain registration process, but you might just start an idea with someone. What are you thinking of? What do you want to do that you're thinking about it? Because in this um, studio, so this is like Catherine started her studio. Laura's yeah. been working with her like three years later. And then I started like two years ago and it's grown as the business has grown because sometimes yeah. it's not, maybe there's not enough work demand for two people. If you started your own little home studio like Dee, she might only teach as much as her capacity is to teach. If there's so many classes and she decides to open up two more slots, she might invite someone externally to come and teach for her because maybe she doesn't want to teach that many classes. But you might want to fill up your cup first and then bring in others. But if you were starting a, um, let's say a friend of mine, we run a kids yoga training, we went in it together. Here's your input, here's my input, together we're creating something that we're offering. Both are fine, it depends what you want to do. Yeah. And I just wanted to know, like, out of your experience, what you thought, because obviously, because now we're doing the branding and the colors and what you want to convey. And obviously, everyone's styles are different. So, like, for example, if you want to bring calmness and you go into a business, because even just looking at you guys from Wellness Connection, everyone's style is, like, extremely different. But you still manage to, like, yeah. keep to a the same, like, the golden thread, should I say? So, yeah, I was just curious of, like, how you would... Kind but of just start the whole thing. That's where it comes down to the values. We're all very different as teachers, but we still all have the same understanding of how to teach. We all teach in a similar way, or we all believe in the same high um, standard of learning of sorts. And even the, all the teachers that work with on the course have that same ethos. Um, and so you do want to work with people that have that same value as you. Otherwise, you're constantly going to be like hitting barriers. But what I've noticed when you have two people is that it's really helpful to have a sounding board <laughs> for people to bounce ideas. Some to be like, yes, we're on the right track. When you work with people, I feel sometimes you get somewhere a little bit further because there's always someone to bounce ideas off. Yeah. But it's not needed if you're just teaching classes at home or you're just going to school and saying, hey, can I teach her once a week? You don't need someone to necessarily go through that with. I'd say if you were starting more of a project or some sort of initiative, I've noticed it's definitely helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. So was there another question there? Can I add something? Yes, sure. Thanks, Clara. Um, where are you now? You shifted away, Amy. <laughs> um, I think because I've started lots of projects alone and with others. And I think depending on, yeah, depending on what you want, of course, you can decide. But if there's also just a very good expectation management starting something together and then saying it's okay that we do this together and you do then this other thing and I'll do this other thing mm -hmm. then you can actually both have like the collaboration the soundboarding the kind of co-creation but you can also at the same time do your own thing um, so I would say just maybe if you have someone in mind even just kind of inviting for like a a brainstorm session and just see if you can think together might be fun to try out. 100% agree with that, Clara. I've actually started a lot of working relationships where after some time I was like, we're not on the same page. Not that, not that one is right, one's wrong. It's just like the way that we do things are differently. And it feels, so it takes a while to work with the right person. But I do also think that even in those situations, it builds you up a lot as a person. Expectation with people is absolutely clear. Like that for me is anytime I'm working with someone from the get go, I'm like, this is what I'm expecting you to do. This is what I'm expecting myself to do. What do you do? Are we on the same page? But that's more just like with any working relationship, not, not just in yoga, just generally. I think that's a good thing to chat through. Um, thanks for sharing, Clara. Matt, did you want to add something? Uh, it's actually a question about sort of more logistics. As you transition from your own practice or teaching by yourself at home, your private kind of thing to studios, 
a couple of the teachers we've had during the course have mentioned that they look for experienced teachers at studios. So how, how do you actually um, show your experience? Are you recording your hours? Are they testing you when you apply to studios? Are they... So studios, in my experience, studios haven't been that pedantic about it, if I can use that as a word. So generally getting in, I guess we mean like what kind of studios, I'm thinking more of just like your bigger studios where they are, you know, they are solely a yoga studio, not more, even gems to a certain extent. But I started counting my hours when I started teaching and I fell off that bandwagon very quickly. But you generally know, oh, during that year, I remember I had four slots a week and you just kind of work off very averagely, but it usually works in years, how many years of experience, which is not really a comparison because it's like, what if you were teaching one class a week versus 12 class a week? But you can say I've been teaching full time for four years in these settings, gyms, corporates, privates. That would be something that I would have put like on a CV of sorts, but getting into a studio is, is really hard if you don't know, if you don't have an in, right? It's like, how do I get myself in to say, hey, can I teach a demo class when a lot of studios to me in previous years, I don't know what the studio vibe is now because they've also scaled down and it'll take a while to build up again, is that they would ask you to come in and teach a demo class, but you've never practiced. If you have practiced at their studio before, some students have their own training and prefer teachers that have gone through their training. Um, but let's say you have done a training somewhere else and they come in, they want you to have practice at the studio to make sure that you kind of align with what the studio offers. So there is a, they do expect a certain amount of time spent there, which for you means financial outlay because you need to pay for classes to see that you go there. So there's kind of like catch 22s involved all the time. But let's say you did get yourself a interview of sorts. I think I had to do, I only really taught at two big studios um, a while back and both of them required that I did a demo class, which means I went in there and I taught them a class and they're like, yes, cool. We like your vibe. You can teach with us or not. And it was more just about, does it align with the offerings that the studio has? It's also a personality fit being part of a team. So each studio will have their different niche, but yeah, it usually works in years experience and whether after your 200 hour, whether you've done any further training. So there's a lot of teachers that do 200 hours, which is obviously it's your essential, what you need to teach. And most teachers have this. So that's that. But if you've done anything else, maybe that contributes. Maybe I've done an extra, maybe I've done my 500 hour, or maybe I've done this specific stuff this specific style that they want to incorporate. Maybe they don't have prenatal. Cool, can I come in there and offer two prenatals a week? You guys don't have a prenatal teacher. How can I fill that gap um, for a studio as such? But I find it's really hard to break that barrier. If in your and Matt's case, if you guys are going to like, a, is it a doja or a doja, jojo? I don't know if it's a do dojo. Dojo, I always thought it was doja. Um, so let's say going to a dojo where they don't have yoga, then you might, you know, ready to say, cool, I want to offer one slot a week and you sort out an agreement with them. I don't think they're going to necessarily question qualifications. I haven't been to a lot of studios as well where they've questioned qualifications or experience. It's more, and even for me, it's it's about how does the teacher teach? Can I see that they've, like what we were looking at in your practicals, can I see that you're calm and confident and that you make, personality makes a huge, huge factor. Are they looking for someone that's like calm and nurturing or are they looking for someone that's crazy and silly? A lot of people are like, no, I once, I actually worked at a space um, at City Rock, at um, City Rock, they have one Cape Town in Joburg. So rock climbing gym, rock climbing gym, <laughs> rock climbing gym that had uh, yoga there and was a big studio and they wanted people who were very down to Sunday vibes. <laughs> they want people who are very calm and relaxed and just like friendly and kind of down to earth and so it was about did you fit in with the team too because a good team dynamic is a good studio dynamic so they also did someone say Jen you heard it loud and clear it's not even I promise it, it's been not involved today it's just too much speaking for my words <laughs> um so yeah it, it totally depends per place and you'll have to kind of sort that out I've noticed that it really is helpful to do something on your own if you look purely from a financial point of view, studio, you, mm, it depends. But studios don't pay a lot for an hour's class. And usually there's other things involved like arriving earlier. Maybe you have to sign people in. Maybe you have to clean. I literally had to um, 
you know, like you after the class, I had to, especially in the hot studios, you've got to quickly like mop the floor, pack away all the towels, maybe spray things down. So it takes up two hours plus of your time, but you're getting paid for like one class um, or one hour's class. So you look at, okay, for the amount of time and energy I'm putting into that, although I don't have to do any marketing, it's a guaranteed regardless of people come, how many people come, that's the one pro of working at a studio and driving around, or is it more efficient for me to go to a local community hall where I can get three people paying their drop in and maybe I pay a hundred rand to hire for the hour or whatever the case may be. And it works out better in my favor, even though it's smaller, you'll weigh that up. You know, you can go to studios and rent on a commission basis or rent on an hourly basis, number of different things. But I highly recommend starting small, like what Dee was saying. And I think even like even if you start at home with three friends, you'll notice how quickly their friends tell their friends. And then suddenly you've got one group class of eight people every week. And then you got two. And it, it does take slow to build up. But then you start. It doesn't happen like this. And you got 30 people coming to your classes is what I'm saying. It's incremental. And whether you're starting online or in person is just a it's just different offerings and see. But friends, family, that is a good place to start with because they're always keen to support you and haven't done yoga before maybe and they're keen to try it out and they're eager to support you. And even if it is one free class, maybe they are, maybe they're not. But even if it is one free class that you offer just to open it up and meet people from a networking perspective, I did that too. I don't advocate that you go out there and teach too many free classes because you guys once you've done your training, you've put in the hours, you've invested in yourself, you've got this qualification. So know your worth as a teacher too. make sure people don't take advantage of you and ask you to do too many free things. But on your terms, it's really useful as a networking tool. Make sure you get emails or numbers or something so you can start a newsletter or start a WhatsApp group so that you've at least got something tangible that you can take with you. Cool. Any questions? so the rest of the session really can go in many different ways <laughs> which I actually want to start it from you guys we can go on and look at specifically at social media so some of my favorite tips for Instagram and Facebook or we can discuss more about things you might experience when you go here for example like what will happen at studios how what are certain things you want to think about when um, maybe creating your own business I want to gauge what our thoughts are as to how much particularly Instagram we will use for social media marketing because a lot of the work that I focus on is more Instagram based but if none of us are keen to go that route I'm just going to skip it and not give us information we're not going to use so by a show of hands who thinks that they are going to want to use Instagram as a marketing tool two four six eight. okay a lot cool we're going down the Instagram route okay so when we look at our tool, so we've kind of Id identified the different types of social media that we'll be using. And we've been going for an hour. So at quarter past, I'll give us another break. Or at one, let's see how it goes. I do want to leave you guys with some, um, like a little task to do. But if we've got our social media tools we've got our website and our newsletter and any whatsapp group those are like owned media like if you have your website you've paid for it you own it you're in charge of what goes on there your newsletter if someone gives you your email you own it you don't own the email but you know what i mean it's like you're in control of it not something like instagram which is like another platform owned by millionaires all over the world so instagram facebook tiktok really great uses, really great resources for marketing. However, we don't own them. So if my business was solely relying on Instagram and suddenly next year, Instagram is not the thing anymore. I need to know that my business or my marketing can still stand on two feet without depending on trends. Because unfortunately, I started my Yoga South Africa page five years ago. And I can tell you how much harder it is to start one now than it was five years ago. Five years ago, it's not like it was easy, but now because there's so much more on there and everyone's starting something, you almost need to work extra hard to set yourself apart. Um, and so it is, for me, it's not about how much you can get, but can I be most effective? 
Can I use Instagram to reach out, connect with people? Because it is a communication or networking tool and then reel them in. Okay, not in a way that <laughs> sounds kind of like quite aggressive, but can I connect with them? Be like, cool, come to my class, give me an email. Yeah, sure, I'll send you details. Great, we've made contact now and now we're in contact off of Instagram too, not just on Instagram. Because I think a lot of influencers one day are just not going to have work because they've relied solely on the amount of Instagram following they have. What else do they have to support that when that's not the thing anymore is my question. So think about that. Um, so we've got our, yes, Belinda. So I don't know if we're going to talk about WhatsApp, but I just wanted to say like I've encountered one or two people that have a like a professional WhatsApp or a, or a business WhatsApp. And it's incredible. Hmm. Like you can put all of your things on on your WhatsApp profile and like hours and specials and whatever, whatever. And that's very nice means. But I but I'm not sure if you want to do that with your personal number and if you want to have like a work number that you use for that. But I just want to sorry, just wanted to add that because WhatsApp is the the business profiles are actually really cool. That's cool. I don't know the extent of them, but I know a lot of my friends use them. I actually love WhatsApp as one of my tools. When I was studying my outdoor classes and I know when we had a, was teaching at a studio here, I started a WhatsApp group, which was admin posting only. And this was my updates. People, I would send a message and say, cool guys, we're doing an outdoor class on Saturday morning. Uh, please send me a private message if you'd like to come, but there's no need to book. You know, it was just kind of, it was a notification board of sorts and it kind of limited the amount of back and forth chatter. But I found those to be really useful for instant notifications. Okay, cool. It's raining. Class is canceled. Please don't come kind of messages. Or for parents, if you're teaching kids yoga, yes, like WhatsApp groups are important. Remember, we've got kids yoga today. Remember that they need to bring this. Or it's a public holiday. There won't be kids yoga. So as a notification stream, love WhatsApp. Um, I also think it's really useful. I haven't explored the business as such, but that's what Belinda raised. There's a very good question. We go into social media as to, are you going to use your personal or are you going to create a business? And so this comes back to the discussion. Once again, if you are your own personal brand, you might just have a page that's just about, it's me and my yoga, like yoga by Taryn or Taryn yoga or whatever kind of accounts they all everyone has now. So I am my own personal brand. So I might share snippets of, my yoga practice and yoga offerings along with just general life things okay we see that because personality or personal factors are what people resonate with people will resonate more with the face than they will with a logo because we're human and we like human interaction but with a personal thing comes in some boundaries you know so am i is this going to be a personal business account that i'm still remaining professional and structured or is it just hey this is my page and i'm just sharing me and my cats in my life and you decide what it is as long as you're certain on that. So people have different things. I know me on Instagram, I've got a Taryn James account and I share some yoga things on there for my friends who do yoga, but it's, I wouldn't see it as a yoga account because I also want to share when I go to the beach or if I go out and do this or it's, it's a personal page. If I turn it into like a yoga with Taryn, I would want it to be more of a yoga center page um, or it would be purely po focused on the business or my offerings of sorts with a little bit of personal elements weaving in because I want to be personable. Business is something, if you have a, a different name, like if you've started your own company, whether it's a retreat company or a wellness thing, I would highly recommend if you created your own name of a brand to uh, identify your social media pages with that name, just to be consistent. So if you've started um, officewellness.com, and call your Instagram page office wellness. It's just going to make sense. Okay. So it really depends if you're going big or small. And if you are on Instagram as a business profile, upgrade to a business profile so that you can use all the wonderful business tools it gives you. So um, that's kind of the one thing. What we do, okay. So we've kind of just established. When we go onto Instagram, I'm going to share my screen with you and just go onto an Instagram page because I think let's go through some of the, the tips that I focus on the most with Instagram. And I just want to go into um, whose account should I go into? I'm probably going to have to go into mine because I don't want to use other people's accounts as examples. Not mine. I'm going to go into the Yoga South Africa one. So...
I could probably use Catherine's as an example too, but let's quickly go there. Can you guys see my screen? Because I've kind of shared you guys here on the, you guys can see the website. Okay. So let's say we've got this page over here. It will look different on your phone, but you know, you've got your um, normal name, your normal logo, and then underneath it, you've got your, it's not your username, you've got a name section. So I've been watching and I've been following a lot of like social media marketing managers on Instagram and watching their reels. And it's amazing how much free information people give up. So this is something I knew before, but I've learned so much specifically that over the last over the last while, Instagram has changed more from just not only just a visual like marketing platform, but it's also becoming more like a search engine, which means you can search for a lot of things through Instagram like you do with Google as example. So this name over here, if my name is at Yoga South Africa, sorry, if my username, my at handle is at Yoga South Africa, I don't really want to use that name section at Yoga South Africa again, because I'm using two points for the same amount of information. So what I would do if I was starting a new page is I would take that username as an easily identifiable thing. It's the name of your business, Yoga with Clara, Office Wellness, Kids Yoga with Lara, or maybe Lara owns a business called Yogi Kids or whatever the case may be. That's the name of your business. Then this name section is either your name, if you haven't used it already, what you do, and if you can fit it in where you are. So you might say, yogi kids and then you can say kids yoga in cape town or yoga for kid mm, yoga with lara in cape town or something like that depends on the kind of things that you have so that if people search kids classes cape town or they search you know whatever they search that you've kind of plugged in all those keywords does that make sense so another friend of mine started a business called yoga connect her name at the top is yoga connect.co.za because that's the website it's easy identifiable under her name, it says online yoga and meditation. Okay, because the name's already there. I'm not going to write Yoga Connect again. I'm just wasting the space. Okay, so that's your first section that you can write in there. What's really nice, and, and this is just about basics of setting up a profile, because that's the first thing people are going to land on your page. In your bio, you really only get three lines. Okay, so we think, okay, what three lines are going to be the most helpful for me? Firstly, put in a website there. If you don't have a website, use Linktree. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot e, e You get a lot of different ones. I just like this one. It's like a switchboard. So if I click on it, it takes me to a whole lot of tabs. And I these will all take you to different places. So you can have one that says email me. You can have one that says see my latest newsletter. That's the one can say uh, upcoming event, which links to your Facebook page. One can link to your teacher's profile on Yoga South Africa. What you can just send people in a lot of different directions. So if you don't have a website with all your information, you might send them in different places. So if people click on your website, the more work they need to do to find the information, the sooner they're going to lose interest and click off, right? So if I've made it really hard for them to find more information about my upcoming class, they're going to click away. Have I lost you guys? On the, on the phone version. Am I here? I, everyone was frozen. Yeah, you're here. You're okay. good. Cool. Did, did you guys hear that part where I said the more the harder work you make it for your client, the more they're going to click away and lose interest. Make your life, make their life as easy as possible. So if someone was looking for a retreat on Yoga South Africa, I don't want them to go onto my site, hover over calendar, click retreats. For, it's too much admin for them. People are Generally, people are lazy, if I'm honest. I'm lazy, right? I want to click twice and then get there. If it's too much hard work or the site's not loading, I'm out of here. I'm just, I don't have time for this, <laughs> which kind of reminds me I need to practice a little bit more mindfulness. But I can just go in here and cool. I'm looking for yoga retreats. Sweet. It's going to take me there right away. I don't have to faff so much. My internet's a bit slow, so I'm not going to fret with that. But use Linktree. It's a really useful tool to send people in different directions. Maybe using a, a ticketing site like Cricket or whatever the case may be, use that, okay? Then under your bio, you've really got three lines to get people to know exactly who you are and what you do. So tell people, what do you do, <laughs> where you are, and you can weave your value in there. So you might say empowering students 
empowering women to connect to their yoga practice, Cape Town, South Africa. Okay. Or tell them what you do. What is your experience? Um, uh, encouraging students to find mindfulness in the everyday or offering tailor corporate wellness packages to suit your need. Like this is like marketing words 101, but you want, people want to know how are you going to help me? Right. So it's more just about um, my, I know my bio doesn't do that really well, but I probably could do it better, but that's exactly people are coming to your page because they want something from you. So tell them, what am I going to help you with? It's more about turning the page on them. And then what's really useful is to redirect them to your link. So sign up for my next free class, or maybe you decide to do one free class a month just to gain people. And then in your link tree, you can have a little button there that says sign up for my next free class and you can direct them there or get your free handbook here. It doesn't always have to be free, but you can just say sign up for your first course or something in action, do this so that you get them to take action on your page. Okay, that's just with regards to setting up your Instagram page. Any questions this far? Okay, so I'm going to introduce a little concept that I like to do when it comes to social media marketing strategy. I'm sure everyone knows Canva. Social media marketers, like we are all now branding. I use it. I know like you can go and do so many extra things, but I don't even like, Canva's amazing. It's my best friend, literally my best friend. And you'll see by the amount of like, any design you want to do, there's my Instagram stories I posted today. Here's covers that I did with the course with Monique. Here's banners. Um, there's certain sequences I made for the yin yoga manual. It really is everything I use on social media, I design in here, okay? And I have set up a brand kit already in the form of a, on your site on Canva, it's, it's free. Let me just say that you can create a little brand kit where you choose your colors and your fonts. So any kind of material you make, whether it's Instagram stories or posts or posters, it's always going to give you the option there to choose your branding colors. I do have the upgraded account, which costs me like, I think 200 to 250 a month, um, but I use it extensively. So it depends on you how often you are going to use it. And what that just gives me is more templates, a lot more stock photos, a lot more free elements that I can use for marketing. So um, yeah, it's been a game changer for me. And they're really helpful if you want to make reels because reels are the new thing. So if you want to get into Instagram, I'd highly recommend you start with reels, like at least one a week. And I say that as someone who doesn't do it, but knows that they should. So I know it's really hard. Okay, so what I want to show you first, before we get into the design aspects, if we think about our, we've done our identification, we know our brand um, ideas of sorts, and we want to go and look into what are our content pillars. So I know a lot of marketing strategy people, people, that's not their real name. They'll call them marketing pillars. I just like to call them major and minor themes because it kind of gives me an idea of the storytelling. So when people come onto any social media, whether it's your website, essentially we've kind of got five, five or six core pillars or core values or offerings that are unique to you. It's kind of your set things that you are going to post and share about all the time. So five content pillars can be the five different things you post about. For example, if you were a lifestyle blogger, it would be like, you know, morning routines, uh, latest advice or tips or a um, skincare routine, you know, thinking about the nature of Instagram at the moment, there would be five different tips or things that she would share or they would share about on a weekly basis. We want to do the same thing with yoga, but not only just sharing your offerings like, hey, I do privates, hey, I do privates, hey, it's like, how are we going to share a multi-dimensional story with them while at the same time being really clear on who we are. So that's why I like the idea of ma uh, major themes and minor themes. So your major themes are what you offer. Like if it was wellness connection, it would be handstand program, yoga teacher trainings, online membership site. Okay. So those are the three things I offer. Come and do a training with me, sign up for our membership or 
handstand program. I forgot the last one. <laughs> it could have. It could also be short courses, right? Because there's other than the 200 hours, there's a lot of little things you can build up with. That's what Wellness Connection offers. Okay, but aside from the offerings, there's a lot more that Wellness Connection offers. That's more like what I like to see minor themes. Like that's what Catherine shares with like how to posts. Um, it's kind of the science of strength, flexibility, and skill that she weaves in there. Um, different body uh, proportions and si um, different body types, proportions, shapes. Those are kind of like minor themes that she's really passionate about that she weaves in that still link to her yoga teacher trainings without selling yoga teacher trainings. Okay. I'm not saying Catherine's doing this because I think she, that's just who she is. She's like, I just want to share this because it's fine. But I'm saying if you look at it from a marketing point of view, it makes sense to show people and teach people something so that they can resonate with that and then they'll know they want to do a training with you. Okay. Um, so a lot of people use Instagram for two things. One, I want to showcase my services and offerings, not in a way that's too advertising. Like we should only be advertising like 20 to 30% of the time. The rest of the 70% must be like more authentic, genuine content. And the rest can be advertising. But um, other people might use their Instagram just to solve a problem. Like for a very long time, Catherine was like, my Instagram page is actually just about handstands for example, because that's what Catherine was really passionate about. So she ran her handstand program on there. Hardy really posts about the teacher trainings and stuff because that was what her website was for. So she's using Instagram to solve a problem. Um, I can't do handstand. Or my problem is I don't know how to have a daily mindfulness routine. Okay, cool. So my page is going to be all about daily mindfulness uh, tips things to do, educating people. And I am a mindfulness facilitator that offers workshops here. I might not, I might promote my workshop once a month, but really I'm offering my followers a tool that will help them. Okay, so for Yoga South Africa, I think I started it because I was in Pretoria and I had no idea what was happening. Like what are retreats? How do we find them? Do I have to visit 10 different websites to see what everyone's offering? Cool, it would be so nice if there was just one place with everything. So my, the problem we always focus on is like, I can't find a yoga retreat or training, or I can't find yoga information I'm looking for. Sweet, let's see if we can find it for you. So that's kind of the solution that you try to fill for them. And that will be different for you. If you were teaching kids yoga, you might wanna just promote your kids' classes, or you can have a page that's focused towards parents that are gonna teach them, how can we encourage more mindfulness and mindful movement in our children, plus, Let's bring some workshops in there. So there's more, it's more than just my offerings. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I want you guys to think of, I'm gonna give you guys a 20 minute break and we're gonna, just during this time, we are gonna write down what are your three ma major themes, things you wanna offer and go for, and then three minor things that are um, resonate with you. So if I think I'm just going to use Monique as an example, because it's so beautiful. So Monique is obviously mindfulness and integrative movement. That's her thing. But if you guys follow Monique on Instagram, she's always like outdoors and foraging and like finding cool stuff and swimming early in the morning. And so for me, it's, it's more than just mindfulness. I'm seeing a vibe of like liberation and freedom. And I want that. So when Monique posts about like going out in the garden yesterday, I was like, oh, cool guys, I'm gonna go out in the garden. And I found we had grenadillas, which is pretty cool. So it was like, you start to weave that way into, I knew there was a grenadilla tree. I just didn't know that they were ripe yet is what I'm saying. But you see that and I'm slowly start to integrate that into my life. So she's helping me to cultivate more mindfulness in my life by showcasing the things that she does to cultivate mindful living through nature, swimming, gardening, drawing, painting, those things. So her, her major themes are mindfulness, meditation, and integrative movement, but her mind, sorry, did I say her major themes, but her minor are those five. Does that differentiate them? Cool. Sweet, let's take 20 minutes, write them, jot them down, go for a little walk, make some tea, go out into the garden, do some jumping jacks, and I'll see you guys in 25 past. Cool, see you, Nana.
Sharon. Yeah. Okay. So I got to show you this. Oh. <laughs> so it's not ah. Uh, he's been having a lovely bath the whole time, digging through his toes and everything. Uh uh. <laughs> I had just when we were leaving, just um, as I switched the video off, my dog came and lay right here on my bolster and just plonked herself right here. It's like you can buy the fanciest bed in the world, but they're like, mm, yoga mat. Yes. Exactly. No, they, they don't want anything else. Don't understand. This. I leave my yoga. Um, this is actually the guest bedroom because we don't have like a lot of open space that's not in the lounge. So if I've got people and stuff coming on, it's so disruptive. So I like hide in this little room, but my, my yoga mat stays out here. Like my mats and my prop will just stay unless I have to put it away for some reason. So often it's like her bed on the yoga mat, uh -huh. <laughs> which is actually, that's why I'm glad I got this red one because you don't see a lot of dirt on it. <laughs> it's helpful. <laughs> yeah, well. Cool. Let's get started because I would love to give you guys a nice, you do have a nice gap anyway, but if we get through all the chats we need to, then you have a little bit of an extra gap before Bev. So is there anyone who would like to share their uh, major and minor theme ideas just to kind of break the ice? And then we're going to have a look at Canva and we're going to look at scheduling and then quickly touch on websites and Facebook like super briefly. But um, I'd really recommend if this is something you want to get into, is to either just go into YouTube and watch some courses. You're welcome to email me. We can chat about it and see what would work best. But to then go like a little bit further into it now that we've set a little brief foundation. So anyone, Laura, go ahead. So obviously I have an Instagram account that's up and I've never really, I, well, I've wanted to do more major themes where I give, um, like poses and how to get into poses for kids and breath work and mindfulness work for parents to use at home. Um, and then also another thing I've been dying to do is get, you know, those blow up dinosaur costumes <laughs> and make videos and like just, and all sorts of dr dress up for kids and just absolutely silly. I love that. Yeah. So your, so if you look at that, your your major theme will always be kids classes and resources, um, oh. for kids and for parents. I mean, your your audience will be parents, right? But then you can always weave it in with encouraging fun and playfulness. So your minor theme would be to be fun, to let go, to like tap into your inner child and your imagination, and that will come through through the fun things that you do and that use that gives you a great opportunity to use video content which is um really growing in popularity and more engaging and fun um so that's a good one i like that i can't wait to see yeah. it now that you've promised yes because now i've actually i just now have to work up the courage to to do it to film myself <laughs> being absolutely ridiculous for the world to see so. so that's the thing is that a lot of this stuff is like not nerve-wracking, but yes, nerve-wracking. I mean, I, even the first time I did a live video on Instagram, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. It's like, why is this so nerve-wracking for someone who's fine talking in a group? We stand up in front of classes, but then as soon as their camera's there, it's like, no, 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 what is happening? Mm -hmm. So, but for most of the Instagram advice I've seen lately is they're like, show your face. Like people want to see you. And as, I mean, if there's anything, I don't know if you guys are on TikTok. Um, I'm just a, I'm just a watcher. I'm not an engager in TikTok. I just scroll. But if there's anything I've learned is that humans love humor and the sillier people are, the more relatable it is. So it feels odd for us, but then you find people who are like you and then everyone goes, sweet, we can all be a little bit odd together. And so that's kind of the wonderfulness of it. Once you've broken that boundary, the people who don't like it, let's just go away. Like they'll find their own thing, but you will kind of attract that lighthearted fun crowd, which is the intention you want anyway. Belinda, do you want to add or offer your themes? Yeah, I thought I'd share my themes as well. Um, I just want to take that off. Um, so my major themes will definitely be classes, 
specifically focus in nature aspects maybe I haven't really decided if I actually want to take on the beach because it's very like it's not a it's, the surface isn't great for that but luckily we have a beach close to us that has um grass as well so I was thinking maybe that could be great so grass is like that and then maybe looking into because we have a lot of um um tourists in our town maybe looking at creating an Airbnb experience. Um, I also have a lot of friends that do hikes or horse riding um, in the area. So maybe combining the two then, like a morning of yoga and horse riding or a hike and yoga or something like that. Um, and then the minor things will definitely be to get people back into nature. Um, and that's one of the biggest reasons why I don't want to do <laughs> no. shop yes. nature, guys. D. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Probably could. You know, just to manage the anxiety and the nervous system afterwards. Sounds like a oh, plan. I, I think we should do like create a whole new pose. But anyway, um, so it's just to get people back into nature and to show people how easy it is. I mean, like you just said now, just literally going into your garden. Um, and I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I live in an area where the abundance of like nature is great and it's constantly changing. But even if you just go into your, into your garden and you can ha look what it actually looks like when a tree blooms or new leaves grow or how a grenadilla changes from this incredible flower to the fruit or whichever way around i can never remember but um and so that would be my minor things creating content to get people back and connect to nature i love that and what i would recommend as like a side note if you wanted to is if you were targeting tourists so also do a little few um educational posts about the city uh, or the, about the town like you know like I love going to places and hearing like did you know like this is this or did you know that is that and so you kind of teaching people who are coming in it's like come experience what our town has to offer and be outdoors and connect to like you know whatever you have to offer and that's that's great so I love that so if I was now Belinda and I was starting an Instagram page um she's got we, we've kind of spoken about five major pillars but I always set up focusing on four different things. So this would be um, kind of a little formula, which I like to use in helping me be consistent because then I don't have to think, what do I have to post next? I know it's either one, two, three, four, and I move through them. So one would be a personal post. Personal, that's something about you. And it, it doesn't always have to be like, oh, hey, let me teach you something about new. It could be something new about me. It can be something like, this is what I did today or what I've been working on my practice or what I realized this week is something something personal. It can also be, oh, this weekend, um, I was feeling a bit down and then I walked out for the garden and I saw this and I was so stoked and I realized how such a small thing can have such a big impact. It's just sharing a personal experience that you had that people will resonate with. Something personal. Number two would be something informative, something that's like, it can be about an event or a workshop or a skill. It can be a how-to. That's more like your major theme, something that you're offering that they can kind of get from you. So maybe you're just posting about your upcoming um, your yoga experience, but it doesn't have to be, hey, come join our yoga experience. It can say, did you know that like you can twist it that you're posting about, like you might post a picture or a video about um, uh, from the mountaintop. And just say like, can you imagine doing a yoga class here, our experiences, and then you using that picture, not as a promotional material with like lots of um, text and things like that, not a poster, you're using a aesthetic picture, talking about your experience, if that makes sense. So we obviously rely on people to tell the cues, but you're sharing more about your offering. Number three would be something that's like very trendy at the moment, which is what they call like shareable or savable content. It used to be quotes, but like that's very much over the top now. So it's often like in infographics, but like a, a thread, like a thread is kind of what they're saying. So it can be like three mindful things to do today 
or three mindfulness tips I wish I knew sooner. And then they swipe and you've shared three tips with them, but it's something that doesn't only relate to you that someone will share to their stories or send to a friend. Because that's what we want. Yes, we're sharing content, but we want people to either comment, engage with us or share it so that we start getting a two-way conversation. It's not just like I'm chatting to people and no one's talking back to me. So it can be anything that um, you share that it can be more text-based or more uh, written-based and encourage people to share that. It doesn't always have to be, but that's just like a tip. And then the fourth one I would say would be a reel, which are not my favorites. If anyone, has anyone started making reels on Instagram? I went through one day where I was like, woo, making reels. And then I had one video and I was like, oh, I haven't even posted it yet. So one of the reels I was working on is like how to set up for yin yoga practice, like wear something comfortable, check out these Instagram pages, like grab yourself lots of pops. Okay, so D, a reel is, <laughs> a reel is a short 30 second video that people share to Instagram. So on Instagram, you can upload a picture, you can upload like a minute video, but these are shorter videos that you target, you can find them in another place where people just scroll through them. And because they're short and direct, they gain a lot of interest because people's attention spans these days are really low, actually. So you create a little 30 second video, which in Belinda's could be, yeah, it's, but they actually, my recommendation is whenever you do something, to just take little videos of wherever you are and, and bulk up your content. So the next time Belinda is going to go on a hike, she's going to take a little video of her hike up her mountain, view at the top, so that next time she has a hike and yoga event, she's going to say, join us um, morning walks. Can you imagine waking up and doing this first in the morning and at the top having like showing her face smiling because she's having a beautiful time, hiking up the mountain, enjoying nature. She's showing people what that experience is like. So people go, oh, it's so beautiful day. I want to do that on a Saturday morning. Because unfortunately, sometimes a picture, although it's supposed to be worth a thousand words, isn't quite enough anymore. Videos are now experiences. So, you know, even 15 second videos are, are useful. It doesn't have to be anything extensive. And it doesn't always have to be a whole lot of clips because making a reel can be quite complex. Um, it takes some getting used to, but I would... Yeah, I really recommend it. It's just something fun. I did one the other day when I just went out to Cape Point and did some videos there. And I think people like seeing them. I haven't done one weekly yet. So I think it would be a lot. I would maybe start to try to make one every second week, but bulking up the content when I am doing something, getting a whole lot of videos and writing ideas. So like thinking of things you want to post before you do it. When Catherine started her handstand program, she wrote a list. So she wrote like one, two, three, four, or you can even have one. Let's say you may have one page for reels, one page for shareable, savable content, one page for uh, personal things. That I would kind of leave open because it really depends on what experience is happening. You want to keep that quite authentic. You don't have to plan it. And then the fourth one can be a whole lot of content that you plan in advance. Does that make sense? So you write down all your ideas. Cool, I've got this. I'm going to just keep using Belinda's idea because it's fresh in our memory now. But maybe I want to do a whole lot of posts about Hans Bai. And I might be like, post a picture about the sharks and then explain why Hans Bai is known for like the sharks. And it's got nothing to do with her experience, but let me teach you about the town that I live in or something pretty cool about the area. And I might cultivate five different ideas for that. Next thing you know, you're sitting with 30 ideas and it's easy now to just do it. Often it's the hardest part is thinking about what do I post next? But when you have them down on paper, it's a lot easier. And I'd recommend when you're feeling those days where you're feeling excited and motivated to create a whole lot of stuff and then just let it come over time. Because if you have to think of it, so I usually plan my posts weekly, um, but information like inspiration runs out so quickly <laughs> so that would be my tip to try and get some videos involved not to even say that you need to post like every day like post as much as what you can if you have the opportunity if you want to start twice a week rather make them two really good posts a week and I actually think that as much posting is nice just to stay like consistent but rather just post on your reels you know making your morning coffee, asking questions, doing polls, um, just getting some conversation with people. And as much as you want people to chat to you, you need to chat to them, you know? So you kind of need to engage a bit. So I like to just set aside, okay, 
I try to set aside like 30 minutes every second day and just like scroll through like what's happening on this hashtag what do people tag me in what's on this and just kind of checking in but that depends on you you don't have to do it as regularly if it's not something you need to check in with regularly and then try to get people like are you guys interested in our next hike and yoga retreat send us your email address below we'll send you the details when the next one comes up so you're just using it to get some info from people nicole Hi, I just wanted to ask, would you advise sort of like looking at other people's pages of similar interests to sort of like gauge for inspiration? Because sometimes it does run dry, but then it's almost like copying and then that's not nice, I guess. I don't know. Well, I think I always think it's great to to use sources of inspiration, but always make it your own. So I've kind of got tired on Instagram now because I follow a lot of social media marketers and they'll always share like tips or Canva hack or like Instagram story tips. And I've literally noticed that they're all sharing the same tip now. Like come up with your own tip guys, <laughs> like stop it. <laughs> because it does become like quite repetitive. But I um, I might see Monique post something and I go, oh, I never thought about that. And then I might post and say, I actually saw Monique shared this. That inspired me so much. This is my take on it. Give credit where it's due. Catherine does that all the time. I saw this on Jenny Rowling's page. Cool, like, thanks so much. That made me think about something else. So give credit where it's due and um don't be afraid to make it make it your own you know to kind of source inspiration from that i think it's completely fine i mean you'll know if it feels like copying or something weird you'll know it'll feel weird <laughs> sorry just another question that i had i might have missed it but in terms of stories would you say you post like every day or every third day or twice i used uh, I used to, I do post, um, it's so hard to say because different accounts need different things. So yoga so is pretty easy because you, you are reposting other things that are happening. You don't have to generate a lot of your own content. But one thing I've realized is that stories are super duper useful for chatting to people, like for engagement, because I think more people watch stories sometimes in reels more so than scroll through posts. So what I don't like though, is that stories last for 24 hours. So if you post the next day, you're there'll be a natural drop off. So let's say you have like 100 people, 98, 60. By the time they get to the last one, maybe only 30 people are watching it. And the more you build on from there, it becomes less and less. So then I like to give a day for it to all clear and start again. So I really, I try for like two to three times a week. And then every now and then it's just sharing stuff or reposting. It's a nice way if people tag you in something to reshare because it doesn't just show your experience of something. It shows what others are experiencing. So even if someone tags Belinda's new yoga experience, she can reshare that as one of her posts as a testimonial or a review and say, it's like, this is what their experience was. So you're not just sharing your side because obviously you think your business is great, but do other people think your business is great or your offering, right? So you can say, oh, we love this as the class, but this person had this to say. And that can come in as a fifth post every now and then um, is that you can use that kind of like you, what we call user generated content to your advantage um and mix up the mediums quite a bit so i do like stories but sometimes i've seen on some of the pages i work with the stories don't get a lot of views and then i go okay do i really need to do it for does it work for me is it not better for me to do something else and so it's just like having a website if you're paying um like squarespace three or four hundred a month and like five people are viewing your website do you need a website or is it better for you to just use instagram and something else so make it worth your while for the amount of energy and effort you're putting into it. I always say. Yes. Sorry, I'm asking so many questions. No and I feel like Instagram is like a thing where you almost want to seem accessible to the people that are looking at your stories and looking at your posts and things like that. But it can become quite a lot to handle on your own if people are like asking questions all the time. So I just wanted to ask your advice on setting time aside for like messages. You said like a half hour aside and a six o'clock every evening and sort of like answer messages and then leave it be because it can become a lot if you're answering messages at like 11 o'clock at night and five o'clock in the morning i don't know <laughs> i treat them i treat them like emails like I, I try not to answer them after hours if i've accidentally opened a message i'll just mark it as unread and answer in my own time so it's the same thing i see as emails like i want people i want to respond um if people comment i'll try and reply to their comment as soon as possible just because instagram likes that and i know they like that so i might as well do it as soon as i've seen it i'm not like waiting for a comment to come in but you do want to be, but you know, people can see on Instagram whether you've read, read the message or not. So it's completely fine to just not open it and 
on look read it when you know you can respond so that they can at least see that you've read and you've you know happy to respond to it i did even see nicole's post because nicole tagged me in one of her pictures and i was like oh there's nicole and i saw your beautiful pictures there too so it's cool because then i'm like oh cool now i know nicole's page and you you start making connections and share things and that's what's really cool about it too so i would definitely say message people and comment you know we don't really I'm, I'm like a silent Instagram. I just like scroll and have a look and I go, huh? But I never comment and be like, oh, that was really cool. I might say in my head, oh, that's really cool. I'll think about that. But I don't comment because I don't really like want to have like a whole long chat now. But it's really useful if you want to engage with people is like to engage first and to, you know, go into hashtags that you know, like hashtag yoga South Africa, hashtag yoga Khan Spy, hashtag yoga Cape Town and go in there and follow accounts that are in your area. See what other teachers are doing connect with other teachers I mean some of my one of my best friends I met on Instagram because <laughs> I was in Pretoria and I saw she was hosting retreats and I was like cool I'm moving to Cape Town next year I'd love to connect we went for coffee and now we're like besties so it was cool like I met her that when like-minded now we work together sometimes so you do get to make really nice connections with people in the community which is also really lovely and see what other people are doing what's on offer um, sharing people's content supporting them lots of many different things we can do. Cool. So let me give you a quick little run through of Canva if you haven't tried it already. Okay. Um, sorry, it's done a funny thing with my screen. Oh. Okay. So here's what Canva looks like. I use two, tip, uh, two apps. The first one's called Canva. And the second one I use is called Facebook Creator. And I use my Facebook Creator Studio to schedule all my posts. So what that means is that I don't have to go on Instagram and type my caption and put my post. I sit on a Monday usually and I plan my next 10 posts and then I just sit and chill and let them go out naturally. <laughs> and it's really, it's just gonna save you so much time. So if you think, okay, these are the next five things I want to share. Can I write my captions, plan them and then decide when they want to go out? And you can choose to do a week in advance. You can do a month in advance. If you want to do kind of that four part thing where you plan three posts, but keep one organic, do that. Cause maybe you wanna share something that comes up on that day or keep it still authentic. But what I find when it comes to marketing stuff, it's nice to do this stuff in advance because it just, you forget and you don't, you run out of time and you put it on the back end and then you just don't do it. So this is one way to make sure that you do get out your marketing stuff if it is purely about your things you wanna share. So what I would do, I would create a design and I go into Instagram post. I'm gonna pretend that I'm Belinda again now, sharing my business here. Okay, so let's say I've got what's great about these templates. Now, Belinda, I'm just going to pretend she's chosen a whole lot of like sage green colors. I'm just getting like green and browns and natural kind of colors involved. She would have decided her brand kit and her colors. What I would do then is I would then go into these templates and I would probably choose about five or 10 templates that I like for me. Um, I try to keep them somewhat consistent in their aesthetic. So, um, these, if you look at them, they all like look like completely different brands. But let's say I'm going to try and find ones that I like. I actually might even type it like these ones with like leaves in the background. I kind of like that. Um, let me type in the top here, nature. Let's see what comes up. So I'm just going to choose three or four templates. I know a studio that uses this one. So I wouldn't use it because remember a lot of people use Canva. So like a lot of people use the same templates as you. So please like customize them and change them because otherwise everyone looks like they have the same marketing manager, which is probably true. We're all using Canva. Um, I want one more, like there's one with a nice little quote. And I want one more that's like a search. Yeah, let's do this one. Okay. So let's say I've just chosen five templates that I kind of like that I think will help me. So here you see how this question they've asked, good morning, love, what's on your mind today? Okay, your people would never ask you that, that would be weird. So I wouldn't share this, but I can use this kind of chat layout 
to describe it so um, or to make it relevant to my brand. So let's say this is someone inquiring about your yoga experiences. If I click on photos here on the left, I've got an upgraded account that's given me access to a whole lot of free images. So I would just type in hike. And let's say I like that photo because it matches kind of my color aesthetic. If you click on this tab here, I can choose a color. If I knew that my color was something along, I was thinking of like this kind of, like that kind of green. If I apply a filter, do you see how it chooses photos that have that color? So it's a way to stay consistent in your branding, which is pretty cool. But sometimes they're not always the nicest photos. Like, you know, they're a bit odd sometimes. So you can just go with something that uses the general colors. We don't have to be too pedantic about aesthetic. Instagram used to be really focused on what looked the nicest. Now people just want authenticity. So let's say I'm gonna use a picture of a person, this girl. She was inquiring, okay? <laughs> we don't know who she is. I'm just creating a fake situation here. But you might use a real conversation that you had to make it authentic, but to protect the privacy. Hi, how are you? And then the next question would be, when is your next yoga experience? And you would like type it like that. So that could be something that when someone's scrolling past, they might pause for a moment because they're kind of intrigued. <laughs> Belinda's like, oh. <laughs> taking down notes. Um, but anyway, so I would create like a whole lot of these kind of things and things that really happen to you. People be like, what do I need to take on my hike with me? If I think about some of the online courses we do on Yoga South Africa, people always ask me like, is there a time limit on this course? Um, do I need to be a yoga teacher to do this course? I take note of the questions people ask me a lot and I use those because those are clearly what people are wondering. So this might be something that you use. I wouldn't use too many text on images. I would uh, mix up text with pictures and videos just because too much text Instagram's like, whoa, this looks marketing-y. So they kind of not flag it, but it'll reach a lot less people if it looks like marketing material. So you want it to be subtle, but also, um, people ask there. You can even in the caption say, let us know what your question is below. So what are things that you're wondering and we'll answer it for you. So let me know your question. I'll send you a DM with the answer. So try to get them to contact you. Um, also, sometimes when you're using your comment, comments and say comment below or tag this, Instagram's still clever and they're like, hi, are you being too smart? So they try to outwit you. They're really smart and trying to pick up something that's too spammy. So we tend to have to be quite subtle. So that might be one. Now this picture five and four are very different in their aesthetic. So you would just modify it. This is into a post. So I would change all of these to be the same font and colors. So you'll just correspond everything so that it looks the same. And this color, what color is this? White, <laughs> it's just plain white, Never mind. I would just make this background white too. So I would just make the colors semi-consistent and you know, use the same fonts and layouts because these two pictures would look like totally different brands. We don't want them to look too separate. We would try to create some similarity to avoid. But this might be something instead. I mean, if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. Cool, you can share that quote too. You might share something about mindfulness, outdoor tip, and then create a couple of these where this would be your first one and then you'd copy it and create a next one with all your tips and upload five in a carousel. If you have a post where you swipe, people spend a lot more time on your post. So Instagram's like, hey, this is cool and relevant and people like this. So I'm gonna show it to more people. So then Instagram likes you. All right, um, this one, you might use this kind of layout for any kind of marketing material, just cause I like the greens and the beige and stuff. Um, a lot of these you see have a lot of text. So I would, condense it so that it looked a bit more thorough. Let me go into one of the other ones I played. So the, what I'm gonna show you now is quite old, but I just wanna show you how things can look more consistent. Um, let's say we created, I'm just gonna scroll through this quickly with just a whole lot of different ideas, just to show how you've then matched, you've taken all the different things, but you've matched it all. So wait for this to load. So I might sit one day and create 30 things and then I'm sorted. I can download them to my phone. I'm just going to decide when I've got to post them and write them. I've saved a lot of my hard work. This might make up like half of my stuff. So let's say I've done those. 
I might have done these are online courses, but the pictures aren't loading. So that will show like a little simulation of what it looks like. They're supposed to have pictures in there. So you, if you're doing anything online, you can create a little simulation like this on Canva. You might have the same layout to use for upcoming courses. Here's a little quotes, questions, um, mostly text. Here's a review. That's what the front of the review looks like. You might have any pictures that you like. So if you know you're doing hike, save the pictures because you might want to use them as a singular post and then just pull them in here. And then you can download them into one file and you've got all your content. So essentially you might have one review template, one that's a quote, one that's a question, one that's an upcoming course, and, you've, and then one that's showing like behind the scenes. And those are your different contents. Does that make sense? So you can create them and you'll just update the template will say the same. You might update the info every now and then, but I've got some things to work with. Okay, any questions at the moment? Are we all on the same page? Cool. Then what I would do for my post is I would go into my lovely little Facebook creator. And Facebook creator looks like this. At the top, there's an Instagram and Facebook, so I can schedule for both at the same time. So I would go, if I was scheduling for Yoga South I'd say create a post to my Instagram feed and it'll give me the option to load and choose a page that I want to load. It's not usually this slow guys, it's just windy in Cape Town and my Wi-Fi is so slow when it's windy. So I'm going to share it to my page here. I'll type my captions. What I like about using my laptop is that I can use my hashtags in like a document. I might create a few and I just copy and paste, which just saves my life. So I might write my caption, which will look something like that. I can add my, my picture. I can add multiple pictures, video, anything like that. And then tag a location, like location is also really important. Then once I've got everything there, in, uh, it's not going to let me do it without selecting a file. Ah, picture of Catherine, how appropriate. Okay, so I'm going to use a little down arrow. I'm going to click and I'm going to say schedule and I'm going to decide when this post is going to go out. For me, posts work really well if I share them at seven o'clock in the morning. I don't know why. I think because it like gets the whole day to like gain momentum. And then when people are on their phone in the afternoon, it's like already got a little bit of traction. Some people does better if they post in the afternoon, evening. It really depends. You'll have to notice what works for you. And then I choose when does it go out, what time, and that's fine. And then it'll go out automatically. You'll have to go through a little process just to link your Facebook to your Instagram. But I can then do the same thing. I'm just going to cancel this so a random picture doesn't actually go out on Instagram. You can do the same thing on Facebook. You create the same page. Remember that our in Instagram is more like um, picture based. And on Facebook, you can share links and events. So you might use different medium. Instead of posting a picture to Instagram, you might post a ticket link with the same caption because you want people to just click directly on the link, right? So the kind of medium you'll be using might be different, but the idea is the same. So I would actually, once I've got all those ideas, write up a little calendar and then decide on what day do I want to share what, schedule it in and then say, okay, on the next two Thursdays, I've got the opportunity to share something if I want to like a little bit more um, organically. Okay. Any questions? I know that was like super blitzy and fast, but that just shows you what I do for consistency because it's very easy. It's very easy to forget. Stories, unfortunately, you can't schedule them as yet. Not that I know of, um, but I do even schedule in IGTVs and stuff. Nicole, you had a question. Um, so is the Creator Studio a free app that you can schedule for 30 days? Yeah, I think you can schedule for longer. So. For me, I was using a lot of scheduling apps. There's one called later.com, another one's called Plannerly. But I found that they were third party apps. So they weren't owned by Facebook. So they had certain restrictions. So for me, it kept needing me to review my connection. So even though I'd scheduled the post, I would have to go in and approve it. And I'm like, that def defeats the whole purpose. I'm doing this because I don't want to be on my phone at seven o'clock in the morning typing up a post. So, Facebook Creator, I'm very surprised a lot of social media marketers aren't using it because it's owned by Facebook. So you can schedule in your posts, you can do carousel posts, you can do IGTV um, when it syncs with your Instagram. So if you even click at, it'll show the accounts that you follow just like on your phone. It will, if you start typing a hashtag, it will show recommendations. 
So I find it's a lot more integrated and I haven't had a problem in the last six to eight months I've used it. It's never given me any issues. It goes out and I trust it. So yeah, it's free. Um, and it's it's like Facebook has incredible Facebook business tools. I don't know if you guys know, if you create a Facebook business page, sure, they are so extensive. You can go on there and they've got like tutorials and videos and blogs of how to do things. And they've got like free resources, kind of like a courses, like webinars and stuff. So they really are there to, I think because they know you're going to run ads for them. So they know that you're going to make, they're going to make money off you if they teach you how to do it, teach you how to run ads so you can run ads. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so that's pretty much how I maintain my social media. I try at least once a month to get newsletters in and send a newsletter once a month. Um, and the website's a different story. I wanted to gauge who uses websites so we can see whether we want to chat about that or not. If anyone doesn't have any questions about like the scheduling things. Is anyone planning on maybe um, creating a website or was thinking about creating a website? Well, I... You have one already. Yeah, oh, well, if you got one already, then cool, that's all sorted. Amy, you said you might want one. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually thinking, I really like blogs. So I feel like I've always enjoyed the people that um, kind of incorporate their story and like their social media with a blog and then have their like daily posts as well as their website, that kind of thing. So I've always enjoyed that style cool. in social media. Yeah, I think if you are going to have a website, you should blog. <laughs> that's kind of my story end of the day, or at least have regular content that's added. So websites are really great because they provide one in one place where you can put all your information. It's like, it's easy. Everything's there. But surprisingly, there's a lot of times you go into a website where people don't have the basics. Like, where are you based? You know, I've been on a website once and I'm like, is this person in Joburg or Cape Town or Durban? And it's always this, like the basic things we forget and even not showing who they are. So I always wanna be like, who's this person? Like, what's their story? What's their credentials? You know, how do I find out more about them and what they do? So how simple it is to just be super clear on your website and make it as easy for people as possible and choosing a um, kind of a domain that works for you. So the same thing with creating an Instagram is that people won't always just land on your website naturally. They won't be like searching for you. You need to draw people to your site through your social media pages, through your newsletter. You need to get people to come, read the story, check this event, book on here, and really kind of create that um, segue for them so that it makes it easy for them as possible and you get drive, like drive to your traffic. Blogs is one of the best way to do that. Constantly adding new content is always one of the good way to do that, especially over time, because it's not as if you just start a site and then you're like front page Google. You know, it takes years to build that up maybe you invest in Google ads, but there's a way to kind of get people onto your site quite easily. Um, blogs is one of the best way to do that and using keywords and plugins and even Pinterest is a great stream for that. I have another question, Amy. No, no, I also just wanted to say what like, I've noticed is also quite important is if you're having like a blog or if you have not a blog, like a website or your Instagram page and stuff, is just to like set up your prices and your schedule. Cause like, I've noticed with so many yoga studios, they don't have their schedules or what style they teach. So then I'm kind of like, can I come to your yoga? Like, is it in the mornings? Is it in the evenings? And what style do you teach? And I've also noticed like that was one thing that I've noticed with a lot of the studios. They don't ever put those things up. Yeah, I think for me, that's what I always like doing in the highlights and um, your story highlights. So right in the beginning, set yourself up. What do we do? So then just be like about us schedule rates and save it there and when let's say um for you nicole like if people are asking you the same kind of questions just be like thanks it's actually in our story highlights go check it out there and i follow a girl who does illustrations and she does that she's like this is how i do this is how long it takes and she, when people ask her questions she's like thanks it's in my story highlights go have a look there and they must just go look and then it saves you time because all the information is there so i see a lot of studios post their daily schedule and I'm always like, why would people decide today if, what class I'm going to do today? You know, like they probably already know or they've decided last night. So they should either post it their day before or instead of posting your Monday schedule every Monday, just recap it every month. Because the more repetitive information you show them that people become bored with, they're going to stop watching your stories. 
So I even notice it on my page all the time. If I'm sharing too much of one thing, um, I can see like numbers of views go down and then you go, okay, let's, let's do something different. Let's get, show people something a bit more new and exciting and then go back to showing that other stuff. So think about what do people want to see on their stories, you know, or what do people want to see on your um, posts and, and how can you show it in the best way? So instead of posting your schedule every day, maybe like for you, Amy, it's like once every month, but they know that the highlight is there or and remind people remember you can check everything in our highlights or go onto our website or sign up for our newsletter try to get them like reel them in for that but yeah um d you asked about rates uh, rates specifically for yoga classes or teachers or what specifically is d frozen d come back Okay, we'll wait for D before we ask that question. <gasps> um, does anyone else have any questions about like social media stuff? I think we've pretty much covered all the bases just as a brief intro that might feel like you guys can go out there slightly more empowered and feel like you can navigate this. Um, wait, D's back. Are you back, D? Signal so bad. Cool. Um, D, you had a question about the rates. <laughs> I don't know if D can hear me. I can hear you. Um, everything went away for, for quite a while, but but I'm back now. Jack's back. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know anything. How do you? What are the rates? How do how do you charge? So charging your students or charging a studio, or both? Charging your students. Charging your students. Okay, so um, it's a bit of a difficult kind of situation because I would also say that it highly depends on what you're offering, where, how, what's included, you know, there's quite a, um, and also like where you're teaching, there's quite a lot of different rates involved. I would say, look at what people are offering in your area, kind of stick around the same ballpark. So drop-ins at a yoga studio can vary anything from now, probably about 100 to 150 Rand for a drop-in an hour class. And but I think that encourages students to take out packages. So they'll have like a once a week package or twice a week package, or they might have a five class pass, a 10 class pass. So um, some studios go, I, I think 100 rands, probably 100, 120 is probably the norm at the moment. And then it becomes a little bit cheaper. So a five class pass might be like 450 and a 10 class pass might be 800 that's kind of a ballpark. And then you get like monthly unlimited that can be anything from 700 to 900 Rand. And I think it depends on how many classes your studio is offering. If you're only offering two classes a week, you might say, cool, you can either come once a week or twice a week and then have a package for each of them and offer something that a drop-in that's appropriate. I think it would be interesting to hear from you, Clara, because I think yoga, uh, I think yoga, I think South Africa is incredibly cheap <laughs> when it comes to yoga compared to overseas. Um, yoga here it's it's not always accessible but it's affordable compared to other countries which is one of the difficult things that we struggle with is that even a hundred rand for a drop-in can be quite a lot if you wanted to do two classes a week you might as well go to a gym but it's not going to give you the same as yoga so um yeah where about are you again d you're in joburg i always forget where everyone is i need to remember no oh you're also in hans by <laughs> we didn't we discuss it I'm in Napier, actually. Oh, Napier. Okay, cool. I, yeah. you, I think you would have to, I mean, if there's nothing else in your area, I would just, um, I would just go for the average, about a hundred rand a class for a drop-in and work out. I would, not, I would not get any takers at a hundred rand a class. I'd have no students at all. So then you look at, oh, then, yes. yeah. So then we look at, okay, is there, <laughs> is there the market for that there? I, when I was teaching outdoors, I was charging 50 rand a class. 
and I um, and because I had no overheads and nothing else like that. Okay, and that was fine for me. I see some people that charge 130 rand for an outdoor class, which I think is a bit steep because they like they have to bring all their own stuff and there's no other perks for it. So once again, if that's if that's the norm for like Cape Town where there's a big demand for it and people are happy to pay that, if that doesn't suit you. Modify it. Um, you might say, okay, instead of a per class basis for the studio I taught here in Fishhook which was mostly older practitioners, mostly um, pensioners. They worked on a 250 Rand a month for one class a week, which was about 60 Rand a class or 400 Rand a month for two classes a week. And that was incredibly cheap in terms of what other studios charged, but was incredibly appropriate for the clients that they had. So that would be my recommendation, but they still charged a hundred Rand drop in because they rather want people to come more than once. <laughs> so they would say, don't buy a drop-in class, rather buy a month. Come for four classes and then decide. But also at the same time, think about how many students you can accommodate. Because if you can only get two people in a class, it's up to you to determine when you're starting out, whether you're happy to teach for 120 Rand an hour, if there's only two people coming at 60 Rand a class. And that's what's really hard for us as teachers is that sometimes we want to market ourselves as affordable and accessible, but also need to make it worth your time so that you feel like you're valued. And in the beginning, you might have to budge a bit on that to build up a network, but it's also hard in the future to put your rates up when you've set them low. But if you're gonna stay consistent because you know that's your, what your clientele can pay, my, my biggest judge of what I charged was how much I was willing to pay. Cool, I'm willing to pay, I wouldn't pay 150 Rand for a drop-in class unless it was like, a teacher I wanted to support, I would, yeah, for me, it was a bit pricey to do that like that, but I might do it once off every now and here if it was a friend of mine teaching. So I used to go, okay, cool. It would be really nice if I could offer 80 Rand a class. Cool. Now I need three or four people to make it worth my while and decide from, from there. I don't know if that answers your question. There's no fixed rules. Do what works for you. And I would also, I mean, I used to teach a really affordable private because I wanted to keep them as a private. And it was, I decided it was worth my time. They could afford it and it was good to go from there. Um, and so as long as you feel like it's worth your time and you're happy with it, I think it's fine. Yeah, so standard and supporter rates are also really good. It's sometimes quite hard to integrate it. So that means you can also offer a discounted rate. I think it works really well. I don't know, I haven't seen it integrated in classes. I've seen it integrated in workshops, um, teacher trainings and retreats. But with classes, it's really hard to sometimes gauge because, yeah, I think it's people then go, oh wait, which one do I have to pay? And you're like, well, you choose what you pay. And sometimes people feel uncomfortable with that, but once they've decided and they, if, they, if they're unsure, they pay the regular. That's kind of my go-to go. I have that same structure on Yoga South Africa and it works really, really well. Um, a discounted, a sustainer and a supporter rate. Um, and you know, at D you might have regular classes and then have special events. So on a Saturday morning, you might have a 90 minute yin yoga and sound journey or yin yoga and meditation that's an hour and a half and then charge a hundred rand but it's only once a month then you're offering something a little bit more and maybe you're offering tea and coffee afterwards then you're offering more of an experience um, with them Ruan also says maybe a discount for regulars i also joined a studio recently where they had a february special i joined in the special and then i joined on the normal rate so you might have a discounted rate for your first month or your first class or something um, but yeah, you can work it out from there. And there, there isn't any rules. I would say gauge, you play that balance between what can people afford, what makes it worth your while and adapt from there. You can rather set affordable weekly classes and then have nice um, additional offerings. So have an ex uh, 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 weekend event or something where you can charge a little bit more that remunerates you for the hard work you're putting in, but they also get more than just a weekly class. That would be my tip. I think um, just in terms of pricing, I'm, I'm not so sure. I think 
in the in London, for example, it's ridiculously expensive. Um, in the US as well is based on what I see. I think Kia and I think you know Amsterdam, uh, Germany, Sweden. Yeah, it's it's cheaper for us if we travel to South Africa. But I would say that the same like the rates do kind of apply in in a similar fashion to what the kind of average um, income of the person who can afford coming is, then I would say the prices are similar here. You know, students mostly wouldn't be able to afford it. Kind of students with maybe a student job who are not um, in, in a special socioeconomic situation. Yeah, they can afford it. Maybe if they have rich parents or, or middle class parents. Um, and I think, um, I don't remember who was talking about it, but I also think that kind of being able to, maybe it was you just now saying, having like different entry ways, it yeah. makes it more inclusive. And I, I think it works well here. So hmm. just yeah, thinking people... the town is very international. It makes sense to have that kind of, hmm. lots of people can afford paying a hundred rands, especially in places that are very touristy. Yeah, and I, I think that's the, uh, I mean, I we I know in South Africa, we often have like local rates and tourist rates, what I also think is quite difficult because I'm like, well, you know, that's also hard to manage and all of that stuff. So I would say keep it for you as simple as possible. But like Clara said, that three tiered structure really works if you think it's going to integrate into your, you can have student rates and pensioner rates, but in your case, D, you might find all of your students are pensioners of, or most of them, you know? So you just decide, what works for you if you're going into a kind of an area where you'll have a very diverse group of students in terms of income levels or you want to accommodate different income levels that three-tiered structure i have found people are incredibly honest um in my i think yoga people are honest a lot of people i'll say look these are the it's the same product these are the three rates you can either just support yourself if you have the means to support someone else you can but that's completely up to you you decide what works for best for you and people say this is the rate that supports me best right now and i say cool that's fine no there's no need to um prove it or say you know this um defend it of sorts you kind of just trust that people will do the right thing and it has worked out so far for me in the last year it's worked out fine um, same with like student rates or things like that or packages that's what kind of helps is to get people to pay for like two months or to get people to commit for a month or two that helps you make the rates lower and at least just supports you for your time because if you also want to support yourself you've got to think about you know what am I going to do that's worth my while the same thing when goes into studios guys um, Catherine and I had this discussion the other day because studios don't not that it don't pay a lot. I think it depends on what a lot is. Like it's all <laughs> kind of depends on you. But sometimes you're expected to get to 30 minutes earlier, do all of like we spoke, it kind of takes two hours and you might get 200 Rand an hour. And that hasn't even covered like your petrol to get there, your time and the fact that you probably needed to pay for parking outside or whatever the case may be. So it's once again, it comes down to what is um yeah it comes down to what you feel is worth it you might be happy to start off with that but the studio fee at the moment from last i heard i could be a little bit outdated but anything from 250 to 350 350 at the um the nicer studios not nicer as in like better nicer as in more value their teachers they kind of have incentives like Okay, you get a base fee of 250. If there's more than 10 people, you get 20 Rand for extra more that comes. So there's like a, the more people that come to your classes, you receive more. Um, and you also get the opportunity to maybe practice there for free. You know, there's often perks at a studio. So those are all things that you kind of go into account. Um, gyms pay quite a bit less, but you might get a free membership and you got to weigh that up if that works for you um we'll keep like i mentioned to you guys we keep the group active if you are approached by a corporate a big corporate um who wants a big offering like hey can you come teach 50 of my clients um in three sets of 20 or three sets of 15 or however the math works out and you need to be there for five hours then they're a big corporate you can charge them because you are the expert in this so you charge them for 
I mean, private yoga, one on one, once again, depends on you and your area. But I'm thinking Cape Town and Joburg and Joburg charges more than Cape Town, even though we've got a big community here can be anything from 350 at the minimum to up to 700. I say 700 and an hour because those are maybe teachers who have te taught for long periods of time. But I know, I think the general is 350 to 500 for a private yoga class. But if you have a friend down the road who says I can only pay 200 and you enjoy it and you have a coffee afterwards and you like it, I think do what's best for you. There's no rules really. Um, it's as long as you're happy and they're happy. That's kind of the end of the story. But for big, sometimes you get big requests. If you're teaching at a festival, if you're taught to teach at a school or something like that, um, people will always say that they don't have the funds for it. And I think that that's, there's definitely opportunities to give back and teach for free. Um, I highly recommend even teaching for some organizations or if you're teaching a free trial or you wanna get involved in community work, like that's incredible. Um, but at the same time, know where you draw the line because you'll get corporates that will contact you and say, sorry, we don't have it in our budget right now to pay you. And you're like, no. <laughs> like if you're a big corporate, I'm pretty sure you can afford at least like 500 Rand to pay me for an hour kind of thing. So don't be afraid to set your boundaries as a teacher because unfortunately the world takes advantage of freelancers and creatives. <laughs> so back yourself. Um, and if you're ever uncertain, message us, message on the group. We can give you a ballpark figure. I always say to someone like, look, this is my rate, our standard rates that you can set out. I usually charge 550 Rand for the hour because I've got to travel and this is what I bring and this is what it includes. And they say, sorry, I don't have that in my budget right now. Then you'll say, okay, what's your counter offer? What can you do? And I will decide whether I'm good. I can like, whether that's good for me or not. Because if you've got to travel there and put aside your time and you can't, um, take up other work, that's kind of a decision you need to make. But um, yeah, just my choose. Especially, as, I just want to say, especially when you're starting off, um, because I think also collaborations are important. So when I work with people, we, I'll come to you now, Nicole, I'll often say, okay, am I doing a collaboration that's mutually beneficial? Is it going to help me in some way? And can we both gain something from this and then move forward? Um, Nicole, you want to add to that? I just want to ask. So for kids, you charge less generally if you're having like a kids class. And then with online teaching, I don't know, with Zoom and COVID the way it is, you also charge sort of like a lesser rate. So I notice, uh, so kids, yes, because the classes are generally shorter. So children's yoga is generally, not always, maybe Laura can attest to this, but from what I've seen, a lot of people charge per term. I find because if if you can match it with the termly rates, this is from what my friend's doing. I'll give different options. I've seen two ways. One way is to say, okay, cool. It's either, I would guess 60 to 80 Rand a class. Am I kind of on the ballpark here, Laura? Am I out? Kind of 60 to 80 Rand a class, 70, yeah. So kind of in that range for a class and you might have a 30 to 45 minute class but you might run three in a row because if you have different age groups. So you actually, it's not just 45 minutes out your day, you can build it up. Um, I've also seen teachers that offer like a termly package because all parents will pay other extracurriculars per term, like their dance and their ballet. Sometimes if it is kind of like if you're offering it at a school or it's close to school to try and bulk it as a termly package, because it means if the kids don't come, you they still bought per term. It's like an extracurricular. And I think that's just a framework that parents are already in that mindset. So you can work for that. And once again, see what other people are charging in the area for that. Obviously, termly packages wouldn't work now because of the current thing, um, but you could think about it. And for online classes, surprisingly, you would think it would be a bit lower. I would think it would be a bit lower because I'm using my Wi-Fi and I'm at home and I'm not in a space. But unfor And you can accommodate more people than a studio. Unfortunately, not. But I have felt that I wanted to pay less for online because... I'm not getting the same as a studio, but that's same. But it would be like a 20 Rand difference. It's not something substantial. I wouldn't charge way less for online because it's still your time and you're paying for a Zoom account and there's still expenses and stuff, but that's completely up to you. You can have the same packages. It's, it's a spectrum, yeah. Even some online yoga trainings are charging the same amount online as in person. And that's just, each school will make their different decision. Cause they're like, it's the same amount of time and energy from me. So it depends how you, how you validate that.
but either is, either is fine. <laughs> cool, any other questions? Cool. So um, that leaves it at that. This is the last time I'm going to see you guys. I'm not going to see you on Wednesday because I'll be yin training. But I do want to say um, for those teachers in South Africa, if you do start teaching and you want to, Yoga South Africa has a free teachers directory and holistic professionals directory. So you can go onto our site, create a nice little profile, put all your information out there, your schedule, and you can use that as a temporary website link if you want to just drive traffic if you don't have a website for now. And um, yeah, if you ever have any questions, please feel free to message me and us and I look forward to seeing how everyone goes out there and does their thing. <laughs>